All right. I am seeing the top of the hour in my time zone. So I think we will get started. Hello and welcome to the Art Up Summit 2022, Envisioning an Inclusive Data Future. My name is Tess Grinock, and I'm here with my fellow conference co-chair, Amelia Kelleher, and we are so excited that you can join us this year. We are delighted to welcome 307 attendees from across six different countries and five continents. And I would like to pause for a moment of silence as we view this map of the world in recognition of the losses and hardship of the past year and the ongoing violence in many parts of the world. Thank you. Next, I'd like to review the logistical and other important information you will need to know for the duration of the summit. You can access the summit schedule from the summit website. Please note that presentation sessions two and three will be happening at the same time. And I'm just going to put this link in the chat here for everybody, as well as a few other links. Notably, links to Whova, which I hope you were able to access the session from this morning or this afternoon, depending on your time zone. And uh, we are gonna be using that Whova conference platform. It's this is the first year that we're doing so and uh, it can be accessed from the link, as well as the link is also posted on the summit website, artupassociation.org slash summit. For those of you who like to take notes, we are also doing community shared notes again this year, which you can access from the link bit.ly slash rdap, all capitalized, 22, capital N, notes. They are also available from the notes link in the resources menu. If you'd like to tweet, Follow us on Twitter at capital RDAP, A-S-S-N, and use this year's summit hashtag RDAP2022, RDAP all caps. We have added a number of resources uh, to Whova, so I wanted to give you a quick tour to view uh, to, of the whole Whova platform. So to view 24 of our spectacular posters submitted for this year's summit, visit the posters page under the agenda. We also have a number of active discussion topics going on in the community, and this is also where you'll find the Ask Organizers Anything chat, which is the best way to get your questions answered, because chances are, if you have a question, there are other attendees who also have the same question. And thank you to everyone who has shared your photos so far. And I'm glad I'm not just not me anymore. <laughs> if you shared a photo through the discussion boards, it will end up on the photos page. But if you add a photo directly to the photos page, you can add one of the lovely photo frames for our digital photo booth. If you'd like to snazz up your Zoom background with an RDAP virtual backdrop, you can find six backdrops to choose from on the backdrops page under resources. If you're new to Whova or Whova, Whova has put together these handy guides, which are also available under resources. And as organizers for the Research Data Access and Preservation Summit, we are committed to providing an environment where all attendees can participate fully in the program and activities without fear of harassment or discriminatory behavior of any kind. The RDAP Code of Conduct applies to all spaces managed by the RDAP Summit organizers, including but not limited to the summit, workshops, and community forums such as the email list. Participation in the summit indicates an acceptance of this code of conduct, and the procedures by which the summit organized resolve any code of conduct incidents. The full code of conduct, uh, see the artupassociation.org slash code dash of dash conduct. We will also have conduct, code of conduct helpers in each session of the summit. And for our, uh, currently in our session, we have Reed, uh, who is one of our code of conduct helpers. And they have indicated, and you'll also see Emily uh, in our sessions as well. And you, they will have indicated that they are code of conduct helpers in Zoom, and you can also find them listed as code of conduct helpers in Whova. So feel free to contact them directly, or email code of conduct at rdapassociation.org, or complete the incident form bit.ly/coc-report-2022. For the posters and slides. We have permission to archive in OSF. Uh, they will be added to OSF 
after the summit, uh, linked on the slide. And these slides and all their links are available in Whova right now uh, if you would like to download them. The recordings of presentations will also be shared on the RDAP YouTube page, but please note some presentations will not be made available in recordings. Look for the recording symbol in the agenda for which presentations will be recorded. We are partnering again this year with the Journal of eScience Librarianship to publish a special issue featuring work presented at the summit. The call for submissions will be coming out after the summit with a deadline of early June, and they'll also be looking for write-ups about the summit itself from attendees. So keep that in the back of your mind. So the last bit of logistical information, we need your feedback to make each summit better than the last. We listen to the feedback you give us. We brought posters back. We created social events before the summit and we're gonna end the summit earlier than we did last year. So let us know what you think about these changes and any aspects of the summit uh, in the post-summit survey, which will be sent out after the summit, or if you think of an improvement that you would want to share right away so you don't forget, you can submit it through our feedback form on the feedback page under resources. And now I will turn things over to my co-chair, Amelia. Thank you, Tess. Um, at this time, we would like to thank and recognize all of our sponsors who helped make this summit possible. Um, we'd like to send a special thank you to our sponsors for their generous contributions and support of RDAP. You have our warmest thanks and appreciation, and we hope you know how much your support is valued. We'd like to thank our amplifier level sponsors, the National Library of Medicine, National Center for Data Services, and SPARC. We'd like to thank our advocate level sponsors, Figshare, Iowa State University, University Library, the University of Arizona University Libraries, iAssist, Lab Archives, and the Information School of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we'd like to thank our ally level sponsors, Illinois University Library and the University Libraries of Virginia Tech. We also want to send a special thank you to our scholarship sponsors, the National Library of Medicine, National Center for Data Services, the Libraries of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and our RDAP Association members who gave generous donations, all of which to support our scholarship recipients. And we'd like to extend a congratulations to all of our scholarship recipients, and we hope you enjoy and participate in this summit. We also want to make a note that you can visit all of our sponsors on the sponsors page within Whova. You can find this within that left-hand sidebar when you navigate down to sponsors, and you can go in there and interact with all of our sponsors um, and send questions or comments and meet with them if you'd like to learn more about them. So we encourage you to visit our sponsors during some of our sponsored um, or scheduled sponsored breaks. We also want to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of the RDAP committee volunteers. All RDAP committees really help support us, our committee, and RDAP in general in putting on the summit. And so Tess and I want to thank the web, sponsorship, marketing, membership, our new DEIA committee, the education and publishing committees, and especially our RDAP executive board. Thank you so much for all of your support and helping us and our committee members to put on this year's summit. And a special thank you to our conference planning committee members, Chow, Hannah, Emily, Jesse, Rachel, Reed, Ashley, and Amy. Tess and I could not have done this without you and all of the months of planning and hard work that you put into this summit. It's very much appreciated. appreciated. Um, and we hope that you're able to enjoy the summit while you're also working <laughs> and volunteering during the summit. So again, a very special thank you. Your, your hard work is very much appreciated. And with that, I'm going to transfer over to our keynote. And before I kind of move into introducing our opening keynote speaker, I just want to go over just some logistics of the session that we're in right now. So this is a Zoom webinar. So attendees are muted, your cameras are turned off. Um, but to ask a question um, of our keynote speaker, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We'll save all questions until the end of the session. And then after the session, we'll um, uh, open it up for a Q&A, which I'll moderate. But if you have 
questions that you weren't able to answer during the session or we weren't able to get to, um, please feel free to drop those questions and continue the conversation in the chat in Whova, um, and we'll try to um, uh, continue that conversation there. Um, and then just a note, this session will run till 1.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Claudia Von Vicano. Dr. Claudia Von Vicano is serving as the Executive Director of the Cornell Center for Social Sciences, which is a large organization that provides research grants, grant writing assistance, research support, workshops, consulting, data services, and research IT. She is the founding Executive Director, Senior Research Associate, and Principal Investigator of DLab and Digital Humanities at UC Berkeley, and is on the boards of the Social Science Matrix and Berkeley Center for New Media. She has worked in policy and educational administration since 2000 and at the UC Office of the President and UC Berkeley since 2008. She received a master's degree from Stanford University in learning, design, and technology, and her doctorate is in policy, organizations, measurement, and evaluation from UC Berkeley. Her expertise is in organizational theory and behavior and in educational and language policy implementation. The Phi Beta Kappa Society, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation and the Thomas J. Watson Foundation, among others, have recognized her scholarly work and service contributions. Currently, she is directing the NSF Improving Undergraduate STEM Education, which is led by UC Berkeley's PI David J. Harding and co-PI Rodolfo Mendoza Denton, where they're conducting research on diversity and data science. She is also the co-PI of the Measuring the Hate Speech Project with Professor Chris Kennedy. I've had the pleasure to get to know and work with Claudia at Cornell, and so I'm thrilled to introduce her to the RDAP community as our keynote speaker. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic, or the virtual mic, over to you, um, and welcome, Claudia. Thank you so much. Um, I have the distinct honor of also welcoming everyone here today and being part of this opening session. Um, and um, really, the Research Data Access and Preservation Summit uh, in 2022, it's such an honor. Uh, also, because of the vitality of the community uh, and the important work of the RDAP, which brings together research support staff from every type of organization and every stage of career. And um, But in addition to that, I was really um, humbled by this opportunity because of the continuing on the footsteps of some amazing intellectuals who have opened the summit in past years, representing traditional indigenous ways of knowing Black and Latinx frameworks. So I'm really, really excited to be here. And I want to um, give a shout out and a thank you to all the volunteers, the program organizers, and a warm thank you to Amelia and Tess for their invitation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, I trust that people can see that. Um, so I'm gonna put it in the gallery so that I can see some of your faces. Great. Um, so this year's theme, envisioning an inclusive data future, couldn't be more aligned with my own beliefs and hopes for research support. The datification of everything has changed the social science research landscape. At the same time, open source tools and methods and open science in general are making computationally driven research community an essential element of any university-based research support ecosystem. The challenge, of course, is building a radically inclusive community and increasing knowledge and capacity not only to serve researchers, but also to activate everyone in the network. Higher education institutions are among the most elite in hierarchical spaces, and by definition are selective and exclusionary. There's a caste system at play that doesn't benefit knowledge creation. In a world where many of our youngest and newest members of the community possess the most facility with technology and new forms of knowledge management. Today, I would like to discuss a series of design principles based upon my work at the Social Sciences D-Lab and later partially replicated at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. I argue that these principles amount to radical inclusion for the future of data and computationally intensive social science research support. 
The examples and cases I will talk about today are drawn from the work that I have done since 2012 in developing a research support infrastructure at the UC Berkeley D-Lab, and later the replication of some of those program components at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. My dean at Berkeley stated to me that she loves the UC Berkeley D-Lab, not only because it's at the cutting edge of data science and qualitative research, but more importantly, because it's a radically inclusive lab that welcomes everyone with the motto, it's okay not to know. I'm currently serving as the CCSS Executive Director and the Cornell Center for Social Sciences is a vast organization that covers many aspects of research support, beginning with the grant writing process, providing grant support and, grant and project incubation, and then providing the full spectrum of research support, consulting, data services, and even research IT. My ongoing role, however, is as the founding executive director of the Social Sciences D-Lab, which is a learning community of scholars, peer-to-peer -peer consulting and data services. Both centers are responsible for running the regional federal statistical research data centers and have a complex set of data services that they provide, including public opinion surveys and data. And here you can find the different links to the Cornell Center for Social Sciences, the D-Lab, and also the Digital Humanities at Berkeley. Amelia has already kindly uh, introduced you to my background. Um, here, there's a couple of links to my most recent publications dealing with measuring hate speech and also with the Digital Humanities Program and the Social Sciences um, introduction to data science programs that I developed. But more importantly, I really like to invite everyone to bring their full person into the room. I am a second language learner, an immigrant from La Paz, Bolivia. I came to the United States as a political refugee, and I jokingly call myself the Bolivian Heidi. Recently, some of my graduate students said to me that what they value most about me is my humanity. So I try to keep that in mind. So today I want to talk about design principles for social science research support organizations. And fundamentally, um, I think that these organizations should be transdisciplinary, actively non-hierarchical, engaged in active listening, seeking those in the margin and celebrating diversity, highly networked and interconnected, and based in real world problems, seeking real world solutions for real people in need. And I'll also be talking about the Data Science Fellows Program as, as one example at the end of this presentation. In 2012, one of my mentors, historian and science technology and society theorist, Professor Catherine Carson, brought me into the design team to create the D-Lab. Immediately, we affirmed the importance of keeping an eye on our community's needs. We wanted to create a lab for us and therefore the proximal advantage of being immersed in research along with other research and faculty. Never had I been part of such a vibrant, transdisciplinary space. One of our major goals quickly became breaking down disciplinary hierarchies and being boundary spanners between disciplines, bringing in many voices to explain the rigor of the methods and tools employed within each discipline. This was clearly an important goal. Disciplinary hierarchies have long divided intellectual communities. And instead at the D-Lab, those distinct practices became strengths to draw upon to build better research design. An example of the power of transdisciplinary work is my measuring hate speech research project, where we had a sociologist, a political scientist, a biostatistician, an educator, a linguist, legal scholars, and even we currently have a physicist to co-create a project that combines qualitative methods, with item response theory, with using a constructing measures approach with deep learning, all along the way, making sure that we conduct fairness audits and rigorous interpretation. 
But there are countless other examples, both at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences incubation projects and the D-Lab research projects, as well as the 20 Berkeley Digital Humanities Collaborative Research Projects I supported that required partnering the, with the libraries, centers, and museums. Here on this slide, you see the comparative advantage that this transdisciplinary design provided our team. We were able to use faceted rash item response theory as opposed to classical test theory, which is quite antiquated. Of course, we benefited from the most recent algorithms um, we combined multiple different platforms, but what we created was an instrument in the labeling process. And that instrument, each of the items guiding mechanical Turk workers for labeling the comments was another part of the innovation. So we were able to achieve, I won't go into much more detail, but we were really able to achieve, um, we feel, uh, the highest performing uh, hate speech measuring model uh, in existence. Non-hierarchical. We continue to involve our community in designing our offerings and setting our priorities. The lab is not a hierarchical organization, but rather a relatively flat one that empowers everyone to speak out and participate with the assumption that together we're smarter and stronger. It is important for us to solicit input on multiple levels as users of our service, as formal and informal advisors. Daily, we ask about problems and possible solutions that they can imagine, and then we engage them in co-designing and implementing. We also interact ethnographically, observing our joint work, conducting self-studies, and listening as we discuss issues and experiences freely without judgment in an environment of continual growth of trust. We move at the pace of trust building. One of my major inspirations as an educator is Pablo Freire, another is Bell Hooks, may she rest in peace. They both speak about the transgressive power of education but also the potential for it to disempower. I believe that we should all have a voice and academic freedom and that we should not sustain a system that has first-class citizens and second-class servers. And I believe that the D-Lab is a vibrant place for that reason. We created community norms and agreements at the D-Lab Norms for behavior and mutual respect. These norms encourage folks to listen and to those who don't frequently speak to step up. These norms help us navigate difficult situations and difficult conversations. Later, I will discuss how we have developed our data science fellows program, but I believe that these values, agreements, and norms were a key element in making that program successful. Engaging in active listening, practicing paying attention, withholding judgment, reflecting, clarifying misunderstandings, and then summarizing each other's ideas are the foundation for how we were able to co-create a laboratory together. In our work understanding how diversity in data science functions or breaks down, Professor Rudy Mendoza illustrates here how we conceptualize micro, meso, and macro level factors that impact diversity. We're actively analyzing support structures for learning, hoping to challenge structural racialization, marginalization, and symbolic violence. Working against norms such as epistemological hierarchy, disciplinary hierarchy, status hierarchy, monolithic conceptions of learning or of students, and meritocratic conceptions of education as opposed to social reproduction. And student level challenges as well, such as stereotype threat, fixed mindset regarding intelligence, imposter syndrome, and status-based rejection, not having taken the right classes, 
not having had the right preparation or the right opportunities, all leading to different scientific identities. This is our NSF IU's work, where we're studying data science across campuses and years. We're conducting analysis of campus climate surveys, our own data science survey, and qualitative work that includes focus groups and interviews. DLAB prides itself in high touch experiences. Scholars at every stage feel welcome and we invite them to share their stories of how they operationalize their research. This helps people take inspiration from one another. We encourage innovation and research by building networks and settings that expose scholars to results, methods, and tools. We support them in trying things out and imagining what they can do. UC Berkeley is a somewhat resource tight environment, but necessity is the mother of invention. Therefore, we work closely with our partners to design services that built from each other's areas of expertise. For example, research IT, the library, the computing data science and society, along with digital humanities and the Berkeley Center for New Media. And we explore deeper collaborative research opportunities with the social sciences matrix. We work with diversity, equity, and inclusion programs such as CalNERDS to increase diversity. And as a result, we are more diverse than the campus community. We've had these partnerships for a decade and they've grown and have been fortified. Also the UC Berkeley campus has gone through a one IT initiative that has resulted in significant campus-wide improvements. We build bridges of collaboration, network, and referrals, uh, referrals to our other organizations in related capacities. We work with graduate programs to figure out how we can further support their teaching and training and continually do outreach and orientation to try to ensure that the entire campus knows about our services. Yearly, we meet with deans and chairs to report on our participation numbers, activities, and to provide qualitative accounts. We discuss ways to improve recruitment and retention. It's kind of amazing that the DLAB is able to serve about 6,000 scholars a year with a handful of core staff, um, provide about 1,400 consultations per year, 300 workshops, um, and we moved from in person to remote seamlessly and actually increased our numbers from those. So we build networks of DLAB affiliates and alumni inside and outside the university. And we use them to keep uh, up to date and in touch as well as to develop opportunities for financial support. So the Data Science Fellows. The Data Science Fellows is probably one of the most exciting and important programs that we launched and we later realized that we had, we had a data science fellows program before we even named it. Our data science fellows program is a variable model. The, at UC Berkeley's DLAB, we offer a fellowship program for only 40 hours per semester. And we've been able to gather an amazing array of scholars. Some of them are even postdocs, um, really, very proximal to uh, securing professorships. But the community, the camaraderie, and the, the network that is built by the program is really motivating to them. And so they've been you know, deeply committed. The majority of them are graduate students um, and they're central to our strategy of disruptive innovation. We take guidance from them no less than we do from faculty or external users. And increasingly, we empower undergraduates as well to provide feedback via an undergraduate advisory board. We build on their experiences and expertise and concerns. That's our workshops, our consulting, our special projects, our research builds on their knowledge. And so we have this graduate staff and founding senior data science fellows. In other words, we have the 
data science fellows who dedicate 40 hours per semester, but we also have senior data science fellows who have, you know, dedicated 15 to 20 hours per week. And in addition to that, we have recognized many of our founding senior data science fellows who were part of the original design of our organization. We define ourselves as a learning organization, and we assume that our strategy has to keep changing to keep pace with developments and methods and technologies, tools and contexts. We regularly evaluate and rethink our offerings, and we watch what others are doing in the social data science world, and we make a point of learning from them. We and try to stay ahead of the curve as well. We built our organization to follow best practices of data-driven social sciences. We take organizational design, management, practice, assessment, and planning very seriously. And we read critically in the literature as experts for advice and look for organizational models. We do research on our own organization using quantitative and qualitative methods. So the data science fellows um, can include many different program components. For the 40 hours per semester or the hourly, you may want to just pick a couple of these different program components. Many times um, graduate students come eager to provide consultation. They've worked on specific research areas and they feel comfortable providing knowledge in a peer-to-peer -peer environment. And then later on, once they've done that for some time, they've become more comfortable doing, uh, you know, offering a workshop, uh, perhaps as a second instructor and eventually as a first instructor. The DLAB has built an incredible treasure trove uh, GitHub uh, repository of different types of trainings uh, on Jupyter Notebooks. They're all in Python or R or in a wide variety of different tools. And so the data science fellows can build off of these materials in order to adapt and develop their own workshops. All along, the data science fellows are working with core staff, partnering with librarians, partnering with research IT in order to ensure high quality um, and uh, to share best practices and the latest methods and tools. Our data science fellows love to share their experiences through blogs and explain how to use different tools and methods in a step-by-step -step fashion, or they talk about their own research and how they did it. Um, in other words, how did they operationalize their own research? Um, we host weekly fellows talks. And these talks, you know, many scholars have high stakes opportunities to give a talk about their research, but rarely are there low stakes opportunities to give a talk and then receive feedback and kind of troubleshoot how the talk went, um, you know, what worked, what didn't work. And so the fellows talks are really this low stakes opportunity to um, invite them to talk about their own research. And finally, I have to say that perhaps the most motivating factor for data science fellows is working on real world research, um, making real connections with government, industry, and um, creating solutions for uh, people in need. And I'll come back to this uh, topic in a subsequent slide. We owe a great debt of gratitude to our founding senior data science fellows. Um, this one right here is Rochelle Turman, who's assistant professor at Chicago. Um, these individuals have gone on to be professors at Chicago and University of Victoria, Northwestern, but also they credit us for being able to pivot their careers beyond academia, if you will, from the humanities at times or the social sciences to being research 
scientist at Amazon, Alexa, um, I'll sh share another slide, um, and working at Google. So people like Laura K. Nelson, Rochelle Terman, Chris Kennedy, uh, Chris Kennedy is now a professor at the Harvard Medical School. Chris Hench, who is serving as research scientist at Amazon Alexa, Ben Gebra Medellin. These folks created the foundation for the D-Lab and have really the imprint of a non-hierarchical communal circle network of trust and support. This is uh, Ben Gabra Medellin. And I'll give you a minute to read that quote. And this is Chris Hench. Talking about pivoting from the German department and moving into industry. And also about having opportunities to work with the Anti-Defamation League, Sage Publications on the Measuring Hate Speech Project. So then I had the amazing opportunity to replicate the Data Science Fellows Program at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. And at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences, we have two tiers of Data Science Fellows. We have the senior Data Science Fellows working 15 hours a week. And these folks are focused on leading workshop production, um, whereby they've multiplied the number of workshops available, diversified the types of workshops, including data science workshops that include machine learning and natural language processing, APIs, etc. They also work in consulting, leading uh, the effort of reimagining how a help desk and a consulting infrastructure can become more robust through peer-to-peer through adding a peer-to-peer -peer component. They also work on computing because Cornell Center for Social Sciences holds the research IT component within them. And coincidentally, a shameless plug, we are hiring a research IT director at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. So uh, please get the word out. And so um, these folks are also providing feedback on what does the workflow currently look like? What, is, what are the services for the compute services? Um, how are they working well? What could be improved? Um, and they're gonna be partnering very closely with the research IT director to support in those efforts. And they also work in the data services area where the Cornell Center for Social Sciences has a secure data environment, Craddock, um, as well as the Sizer archive. And so it has a very robust data services infrastructure in addition to the FSRDC. Um, and we partner very closely with the Roper um, Institute. Our faculty director, Peter Enns, is both the director of the Cornell Center for Social Sciences and the director, the executive director of the Roper Institute. So there's very robust um, uh, poll data, uh, both surveys and poll data that are available. And then we have, we move on from there to the hourly, about five to eight hours, depending on what the graduate students have available to them. Um, and so they plug in to the workshops, they write blogs, they provide some consultation and support. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. This um, new program has been implemented now for a little shy of a year, and it's been extremely well received. So it's been a really nice proof of concept to see that not only is it a successful program at the D-Lab at UC Berkeley, but that it can be replicated in a different environment and that it's valued and appreciated um, in a perhaps a bit more research resource-rich environment, which can be more challenging 
Um, and um, I've received feedback and, and collecting quotes, but um, first of all, people really felt like the camaraderie and the community that is interdisciplinary um, has been an amazing addition to their programs. They've also, the skills and the knowledge that they've developed has enabled them to apply for internships and positions that otherwise they've stated they felt that they would not have secured without this hands-on experience that they developed. Um, and um, I think more importantly, they're contributing intellectually to the formation of the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. The center uh, is composed of, uh, it's a merger between two different centers that existed previously. And so therefore it's a reorganization, it's a new organization. And, and so it's a very important time for these um, innovators to come in and to leave an imprint on the organization. It's been a really lovely experience uh, working with them. So going back to the D-Lab, um, the D-Lab has had to be extremely entrepreneurial. Um, when I formally joined the D-Lab as the founding executive director, building from our data science services, our data services lead, John Stiles, who served as interim director, I brought with me my, my work from the Digital Humanities and a Mellon Foundation grant that we combined with the campus funding to extend the impact of both efforts. We define the financing models as integral into our service delivery. Uh, we worked on models that combined easy access to baseline services with a range of options for paying higher for longer or deeper, more specialized services. So to be a little more specific regarding what I was talking about earlier in terms of outreach and orientation, our center goes out and talks to my faculty director and I go out and talk to every single dean of different professional schools to give them their data of who has participated in our center and um, what have the services been and what's working well. And then we ask them to tell us, you know, what else do they need, how we can better serve them. And so that is what we mean by a scalable model. And in turn, they provide what we used to call common good funds or department commitment. So this is not a recharge and it's not an MOU of like uh, sort of bean counting or exact numbers. This is the concept is that we're creating a good for the campus like the library is, for example, and that we should contribute to that lab, that good, so that it yields at scale, as, as opposed to building out um, at every different college in every aspect of campus, which I think is more frequently what happens rather than building a central um, campus resource. And so everyone contributes commensurate to the amount of services that they receive and commensurate to the scale of their college. And we developed you know, this common good model and later simplified it to a departmental commitment model. The model again is neither a fee or recharge unit, but it's a reasonable contribution that um, at scale leverages immense resources. And we pitched our rates at a level that is realistic across domains with different levels of resources. We sadly, usually the arts and humanities have less resources than the social sciences, which have less resources than the sciences. And we help users devise strategies for raising funds for additional services if needed. And I'll talk a little bit about that momentarily. We treated users' reactions to financing strategies as feedback loops, suggesting where and how we should adjust what we do. And we continue to have these conversations yearly, primarily with the deans and appointed faculty, but also at the part, uh, faculty uh, meetings. We think of people as our most important investment. We developed a community of practice and a professional learning community where members usually begin at the peripheral participation. This is also really important for diversity. Um, there's research that shows that people need to be able to just listen and not actively participate before they start to participate and because that lowers our anxiety. 
Um, that is a term that indicates that you can observe and participate as you feel comfortable. And then uh, this has been shown to increase diversity of participants because it is a gentle way to address imposter syndrome and stereotype threat. We move participants into roles that include consulting and then instruction. And subsequently, we have hired many of our once participants into our core staff roles. We choose staff based on their capacity, commitment, and willingness to learn. And most importantly, their disposition. Um, we investigate what is needed for them to have successful and satisfying careers in the D-Lab. We work in mobilizing resources to make that possible. We find that the most important factors for them includes having a voice in the programs that they are implementing, continue their own research and special projects, but above all, having a caring environment where toxic behavior is not tolerated. Um, so some of our real world projects that have been extremely exciting um, for our graduate students and postdocs and for ourselves to work on include um, the data for housing. Data for housing was a wonderful project that we were able to advance with Karen Chaplin, Chapman from the College of Environmental Design. It is an intensive um, data science coursework focused on housing policy, where we invite the participation of policymakers who are working in government, who are working in nonprofits, and the pricing structure is also appropriate to the organization. It was a very successful program that we uh, plan to repeat. And many of our graduate students engaged in the program learned a huge amount of how to create a website, how to have an organization launch a new program, how to develop a curriculum, how to use GitHub, how to use Jupyter Notebooks, how to debug your Jupyter Notebook, how to work in instruction, coaching, mentorship, and support. So it's just an incredible opportunity and, and all the exemplar research projects that come into play as well. Data for Health has been uh, perhaps one of our most successful areas of specialization with uh, the amazing support of our senior founding data science fellow, Chris Kennedy who's now at the Harvard Medical School. Um, we partner with UCSF, who are running the Big Data for Health Equity. And one of the projects that um, is forthcoming is a project that looks at the health impacts of hate speech. Uh, and that project was enabled or could not have ha happened without the model that the Measuring Hate Speech Project created. Um, in addition to that, we also have a digital health publication uh, with Caroline Figueroa, who was also a, data, a senior data science fellow with us. And that publication um, is exploring the ethical dimensions of data. Uh, this includes who is the community of interest that we are studying? How vulnerable are they? How can we prevent doing any damage to that community? How can we actually proactively empower that community in the process of doing the research? What are the basic literacies that we're assuming in terms of digital literacy or just literacy in English period? Um, and how can we ensure accessibility to digital health? Digital health includes things like um, measuring the amount of exercise or the food that you're taking and um, looking at your vitals, et cetera, and has been linked to improved health outcomes. So that was a wonderful project that is culminating in a publication um, that has been um, approved and uh, is forthcoming. Data for education, one of the first areas where we started to explore our special projects, which are, by the way, revenue generating, is uh, college going futures and conducting analysis of course taking patterns and community college to higher education. And again, here, wonderful opportunity for education students to um, be in a real world uh, project. And finally, the last uh, project that I'll talk about is the Digital Refugee Project. 
which was a geospatial project that Patty Frontera, our interim executive director at the D-Lab currently uh, spearheaded. And you know what an important project at a time like this. So um, with that, I just wanna thank you again and open it up for um, um, questions and conversation. Uh, this is really meant to be a catalyst for hearing from all of you. So I really hope that um, we can have a conversation about all the important work that everyone here is doing and what of anything that I've said has resonated. So thank you so much and uh, looking forward to more conversation. Great, thank you, Claudia. Um, at this time, I'm gonna go into the Q&A and see what questions we have, but also invite folks now to drop their questions into the Q&A um, and I will keep an eye on chat too in case they show up there. But I think we have a couple. Yes, thank you so much for a very wonderful key keynote um, and for a very rich and engaging Q&A. So at this point, we're gonna take a scheduled break. Um, just a note, you can access Claudia's slides through Whova. They are uploaded there and will be later in RDEP's OSF if you're curious about those. Um, so we'll see everyone back here in 10 minutes for our first presentation session at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks everyone, bye now. Okay. So it looks like it is 1.30, so it's time for uh, presentation session one. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Thomas. I'm one of the um, planning, STEM planning committee uh, members, and I will be your moderator for today. Um, so let me get my notes up so I can um, give you all the information. So first, welcome uh, again, and just some housekeeping logistics. This is a Zoom webinar. Attendees are muted and your cameras are turned off. To ask a question, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, this session will run from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 30 minutes past the next hour in your viewing location. And the last 15 minutes are gonna be reserved for a Q&A period. Please indicate the presenter presenters um, you would like to direct your question to when you're typing in the Q&A box. We'll save all questions until the end. Um, after the session, please feel free to drop any additional questions um, or continue the conversation in the chat window in Whova. A quick note regarding code of conduct, the RDAP Summit organizers are committed to providing an environment where all attendees can participate fully in the program and activities without fear of harassment or discriminatory behavior of any kind. There are two code of conduct helpers available during this session, um, Reed and Emily, who you can identify with the COC helper text next to their name. You may direct messages to them in Whova if you need assistance. Um, they can also give you the code of conduct email address or a link to the incident report form if you need it. So in order to get this started, let's go ahead and get this kicked off. And so, to start off, um, please welcome Amy Kashoffer and Rebecca Olson to the screen, and they will be our first round of presenters. So welcome, Amy and Rebecca. And you should be able to share your screen. Okay, well, thank you for uh, letting us be the first session after the amazing keynote speaker. Um, I'm Amy Koshoffer, Assistant Director for Research and Data Services, and I'm joined by my colleague, Rebecca. Rebecca, you're muted. <laughs> Amateur hour here. Hi, I'm Rebecca Olson. I am the informationist for social science and business here at the UC Libraries in the Department of Research and Data Services. And um, I'm going to start by saying I'm probably going to shut my video off because I have a cold and I don't think you're going to want to see my, um, my cold. Okay. Anyways. 
The Cincinnati area and the land that the University of Cincinnati has been built on is the native homeland of the indigenous Algonquin speaking tribes, including the Delaware, Miami and Shawnee tribes. We acknowledge the traumatic past as we move forward, consciously doing things intentionally for the sake of people, animals and plants that share our environment. We hope our leaders think the same. And our learning objectives for this presentation is that after attending it, we hope you understand how to foster an inclusive research culture through standardized training and appropriate resources and tools. How to partner with those involved with undergraduate research training and education. Oops. And how to how research data service professionals can encourage healthy mentor-mentee relationships to create similar programs at their own institution. I will be talking about our undergraduate program and Amy will be talking about our graduate and uh, professional program for faculty. In this field, we normally either put together our own workshops or we give a presentation tailored to a specific class. But how can you have a bigger impact on under graduate populations who may need additional help in learning about the culture of research. Though these tailored classes are important to the students, the relationships you build with the professors can lead to bigger opportunities to reach even more students. Formalized programs of instruction, such as summer research programs, honors programs, and targeted inclusion programs, all have opportunities for research data management professionals to step in and play a more active role in training undergraduates to be successful researchers. This can be done through stressing qualities necessary for working in research, especially for those undergraduates who have not participated in formalized research training. In our case, Amy developed a relationship with Dr. Megan Lampkin, the Director of Undergraduate Research. Amy had been invited to prevent at the present, excuse me, at the undergraduate summer research program as a one-off on library resources and data management skills. Mm -hmm. Seeing a synergistic opportunity, Amy and Megan worked together to create a program to train undergraduates on how to be effective in research, how to develop relationships and communication skills, how to be a good mentee for maximum impact. When I joined in 2020, the program went from a single standalone lecture by university faculty from various areas to a cohesive program led by an integrated team of faculty and staff members and one graduate and two undergraduate student assistants. This summer sessions in 2022 will be held in a hybrid manner with the students in person with their related groups and the instructors will join online with the pods of students. In 2021, our team consisted of five university employees who came from the library's honor program and inclusive outreach programs from the College of Engineering. Don Whitrock has a master's in education and has been a science teacher for several years. His experience with active learning allowed us to make our classes more interactive and more importantly, fun. If you have the ability to partner with somebody who has uh, teaching experience with undergraduates or high school students, I highly recommend working with them on your curriculum. The format last year is we had nine weekly meetings with undergraduates who are on co-ops, in research labs, and some were not in research at all, but we're taking it for future knowledge. They came from various disciplines, both science, medicine, and the uh, humanities. We had students from around the world attending and it was, uh, we held meetings virtually via MS Teams. And we used homework such as reading articles and um, filling out surveys. We used breakout rooms during the sessions and we also used interactive tools and surveys along with Kahoot, Flipgrid and other educational fun learning tools. Every week started with a check-in. Uh, we wanted to ask the students about how their feelings are and how things were going. We wanted to demonstrate the importance of mental health well-being on all and that the undergraduate feelings were valid and should be shared if they were overwhelmed or if they had problems with something. Normalizing discussing stressors with others is good practice for them to share issues and concerns with their mentors. Besides the experience and the knowledge gained from the program, the students who participated were eligible for incentives from their specific programs and could receive funding for conference attendance from Megan during the activity the academic year. 
Students also have the opportunity to apply for the student leader positions for future sessions, which also included a stipend. In our 2021 program, um, we had several, uh, this, is the, this is what we presented on the different weeks. Typically, our department would only be in week three, um, such as how to evaluate resources and the data stewardship weeks. But we led the sessions on mentorship, ownership of data, and research ethics as well. We took aspects of data management best practices and were able to translate them into areas that students may not be aware of, such as, can you write a paper on your experience in the lab this summer? Possibly not, especially if the research is under review or contains sensitive data or is being considered for a patent application. Why is it important to keep and share your data? What are the implications of using data gained from unethical experiments? Knowing the why behind the what of research rules and guidelines is not only informational for the students, but may also be empowering. Okay, so I'm gonna start my part of the presentation on the mentor training programs. Um, as Rebecca highlighted, we really based the beginning of this with the mentee, but there's no way to completely empower, especially an undergraduate, to overcome this power differential that's there in this interpersonal relationship. So we really have to focus on the mentor if we want to have a truly inclusive culture in research. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, study or report from the National Academies published in 2019 really um, took a, a look at the state of mentorship in STEM specifically, and for us was a guidepost for the work that we were doing, especially these, with these two um, themes that rose, that negative experiences commonly arise unintentionally, either through you know, lack of self-awareness from a mentor or um, lack of cultural competencies, but it also disproportionately impacts those groups that have been historically excluded from the research process. So we really took these as guideposts to help us think about how to train mentors better to be effective research mentors. Next slide, please. Okay. So at this point, the state of research mentorship has been mostly ad hoc, and we um, would really like to see and follow the advice of this report that there should be a culture of best practices where individuals, the mentor and the mentee can enjoy productive, mutually satisfying mentorship relationships. At the core of this, this is a, a personal relationship between two people and it really should be mutually satisfying for both, especially the mentee. So to achieve this goal, we need to really highlight the fact that mentors need to be much more intentional about this work. Just because you've been granted a degree doesn't mean that you're going to be a good mentor, but if you're much more intentional, consider what needs to be um, done in this relationship, do the work in this relationship, then you can be more successful. But to actually help that, then we need standardized training. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that we can get this standardized training is to um, go to programs that are already really established, one of them being the Center for the Improvement for Mentored Experiences and Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and shout out to our colleagues from University of Wisconsin here. Um, our director of undergraduate research, the director of the Faculty Enrichment Center, and another faculty member actually were able to attend one of these um, facilitating entering mentoring in person in the fall of 2019. And they brought that back that experience to UC to help us develop a um, in-house training program at UC. Next slide, please. So in January of 2020, um, the three of them offered a one-day um, research uh, mentoring optimizing your practice workshop and it was attended by various people participating in the research process at UC including members of the library staff, uh, the honors program and the McNair scholars program. Here's an example of the workshop agenda um, which is really based um, on the amazing curriculum from the Simmer training program. Next slide please. Um, you may ask yourself, do, do, should information professionals be involved in this work? And I would say very much yes. <laughs> um, probably many of you are already involved in research and are mentors yourself, but we can find all kinds of alignment with our work. So to take an example, the 
um, learning objectives from the very first module um, about effective communication and building a compact with the mentee. Um, if I can have the next slide, a compact is an, an explicitly written document that explicitly describes what is expected by a mentee and a mentor, and that is all the things about the communication, project meetings, and data management ex expectations. So this is a really great way to teach an undergraduate about research data management and to explicitly state what are those expectations and help train them to achieve those expectations. Next slide, please. Um, we have developed trainings and we have done it in various formats. Obviously due to the pandemic, we had some changes in the way we were going to approach this, but we've been able to do virtual presentations. We've been able to do in-person when we had our return to campus. We have focused very much on specific groups such as postdocs and graduate student mentors with our RAMP program training. And one thing that we're really hoping to focus on is onboarding new faculty that they would take this as a training and so we started that in fall of 2021. So next slide, please. We have taken from the SIMR training, um, the different modules, they use case studies, small breakout groups, writing reflections, jam boards, large group reflections. So a various um, uh, different methods for in engaging with our participants. And it's been um, a really effective method for helping to build community within our training programs. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of our, we have actually modified the training a little bit. Um, we pulled out the module on effective training and actually have woven it throughout. So we are teaching basically four sessions, um, three of them specific modules and one on introduction. Next slide, please. I will say that um, one of the challenging modules can be actually challenge um, module two, um, where we are actually focused really on that inclusive culture. Um, we explore it through identity wheels, but what happens in that environment can be that participants start to share very traumatic experiences from their own mentoring relationships. And sometimes we might want to rush to say, oh, we can fix this through the training, but sometimes the best thing to do is just to sit and listen and say, we believe you and reaffirm their own experiences. And that can really help to build um, the psychosocial safety that they need and also help to have them realize that they are not alone in having had a certain kind of experience and they share with others who are participating. It can also be challenging because we might inter, um, realize that there are individuals who are not self-aware. And so by having this shared community, those people can start to appreciate the other experiences that um, individuals are having. So though it can be um, hard for us to listen, this is actually an incredibly powerful module. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we are also, like I said, engaging with many different peoples involved in the research process. One of them, uh, which has been very rewarding, is that the Office of Research is starting to be much more involved with our research mentor training. Two of the staff members are actually part of our facilitation group, and they have begun to incentivize new faculty who um, are taking research-focused training, specifically also the mentorship training, and they will um, give them financial incentives to participate. And this helps us to really spread the word and also to spread the knowledge. Okay, next slide, please. Um, in conclusion, um, this collaboration has been a long time in the making. Um, we are very lucky to have someone like Megan Lamkin who has such love and vision for student researchers. And I'm sure that all of you have individuals like this on your campus too. Um, we've been very encouraged by the different support offices that are participating. And it has really been a very effective method to educate researchers, especially those at the beginning of their research career. And if you want to ask us questions outside of the conference, um, you can contact us. But we wish you all a really great RDAP conference. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Amy and Rebecca. Good. And so now we're going to go ahead and have Peace Awesome Williamson who will tell us more about building capacity for data services among health sciences information professionals. Peace, whenever you're ready. Hello, I just wanna to check to make sure you can hear me okay? Yep, can hear you loud and clear. All right, wonderful. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Peace Awesome Williamson. I'm the Associate Director of the NNLM National Center for Data Services, and I wanted to present to you our efforts toward building capacity for data services, particularly among health sciences information professionals. Before I get started, uh, we're a little bit of an al uh, alphabet soup kind of <laughs> group, and so I wanted to provide a little bit of background on who we are. So the National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. Um, NIH consists of 27 institutes and centers. Uh, you may be familiar with the National Cancer Institute or some of the others. Uh, one very obvious example at this time is Dr. Fauci, who is and has been director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984. And obviously this institute has gained quite a bit of uh, national attention during the pandemic. Um, we are within the National Library of Medicine, which is also an institute at NIH. It's the world's largest biomedical library, and it maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources like Medline Plus and PubMed. Now, NNLM is the network of the National Library of Medicine, and it's an outreach arm for the NLM. We are made up of seven geographic regions, um, but we also have several national offices and centers, which includes the NCDS. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of who we are. Um, this is getting into the center. We are just a group of librarians coming together to collaborate and innovate services to information professionals. As part of the NNLM, everything we do is free and open to all, and we are funded through, again, the NIH. Um, pictured here are us, <laughs> the director, Elisa Serkis, who is also associate director of the NYU Health Sciences Library, uh, myself, uh, I am Justin De La Cruz. We are full time within the center, and Justin is our program specialist who started in January. I started in October. We also have uh, Deborah Peters, who does our administrative work, and we have three content experts out of the data sciences team from NYU Health Sciences Library. Um, they provide kind of that practitioner knowledge um, and infuse what they know into everything that we do with the center. We also have an external advisory board. You can see their names and uh, images in front of you. These are a mix of um, clinicians, researchers, informatics experts, and so on, who will help have that outside perspective um, kind of in the data world and things that we might miss or not think of um, being kind of focused on librarians. So about the NCDS and our goals. Now the NIH has three aims and of those, two of them are data related. One is to advance discovery and advance health by providing the tools for data-driven research. And another is to build a workforce for data-driven research and health. So we work to support that by developing capacity to conduct data science and or deliver uh, data services in the health information community. We partner with other national data or health sciences organizations to maximize impact, and we support NIH's priorities in the domains of data science, data services, and data governance. So how do we do this? We build on our team's expert, expertise and experiences with the data catalog, courses on data ethics, providing data management, creating open educational resources and learning opportunities around library data services. And that um, is reflected in these three ways. We have beginner trainings for people just getting started with what is this whole data thing? How can I learn more about it? To development, we, we plan to move more over time into providing kind of on the nose training, helpful, um, specific ways for people providing data services to get continuing education. And then we also provide resources um, that are online, again, free and available for people to make use of as needed. Um, so first I'll just talk quickly about the training that we provide, again, at these two levels for beginners and then for, for development in regards to data services. 
Um, first, I'll mention we have a symposium coming up March 29th and 30th. This is called the NNLM Virtual Symposium or Research Symposium. The focus of the symposium is kind of on community-informed research, um, patient participation in healthcare, and um, data and ethics in research and health. So uh, again, this is free and open and we'd love for you to register and attend. It's coming up March 29th and 30th. Um, within the NCDS, we have courses that we are developing, designing and um, revising. We are making these available as kind of a cohort opportunity for people to go in and participate with one another, with an instructor, sometimes with a mentor, uh, in order to kind of have that support during their learning process. Uh, starting this summer, we'll have a kind of introduction re to research data management and curation. Now, this was formerly called REM 101, as pictured on the screen. Um, however, we will be, it's, we are revising it and renaming it. And it is a eight week, if I remember this correctly, course uh, that you can enroll in and participate in. Um, and it will be followed by additional courses. So uh, beyond research data management was kind of the data science side. And so we'll be developing, again, cohort courses for people to um, participate and learn more about data science, uh, whether they want to learn about programming or not. Um, and what's really interesting is we have four modules online um, currently that are on demand. So you can take them at any time. And these are on research data management. And um, for that opportunity for continuing learning, if you do not have the capability of participating in a multi-week online course. We also have opportunities for skill building. So things like programming. Um, we are members of the Carpentries. Uh, we also have num numerous trained instructors. I'm a trained Carpentries instructor and we have uh, sessions coming up. So this summer, July 18th and 19th will be our very first Carpentries. And we're really excited to offer that. It will be um, a hosted Carpentries, but we do plan to develop and grow and offer our own work Carpentries um, for our community, as well as things like Codathons for a way of kind of situating that learning. Um, now, information about kind of our less involved learning opportunities. We have introductory webinars, which are high level introductions to keep communities up to date on important issues. We also have two types of practitioner perspectives. One are like talks and panels by those working in a topic area. And the other type are moderated discussions with those working in data librarianship. And so the idea of the practitioner perspective is that, you know, people who are again, looking for that development, looking to have conversations with others in their, in their field or facing their same particular challenge uh, can also get support and continuing education around the types of data services that they're providing. In that regard, we have a series that we've started this year around the new NIH data management and sharing policy. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, the NIH has a new requirement that is going to come into place January 2023. And so we are working to inform librarians of how to support their uh, campuses through this webinar series. So it started on Love Data Week with an introduction to the policy. Um, that introduction is recorded and available online for viewing at any time. So you can always go back, even though it's, it's passed, you can go back and view the recording on the NNLM's YouTube page. Uh, and that's just kind of an overview of the policy, what's different between the policy from 20 years ago and how uh, those changes should be made for researchers who are applying for NIH funding. Um, following that, we have three, which two are remaining, uh, practitioner perspectives, you can see uh, pictured on the right, talking about kind of different aspects and ways that data librarians are working with their campuses or communities around education, building infrastructure, and so on in advance of this new um, implementation of this policy. Uh, our next session coming up 
is on education on March 21st, and it will be uh, presenters are Ariel Deardoff and Nina Exner, and they're going to be talking uh, all about education. We also will end the series with a kind of recap of the policy offered by the NIH, um, I guess, policymakers themselves, Talton Payne and Cindy Danielson, who will be there really less to present. They'll, they'll give a quick recap, but then mostly to answer people's questions. We've seen an uh, outpouring of questions regarding what this means, what librarians are doing, uh, clarification on certain terminology and things like that. And so uh, we wanted to kind of cap off all of the webinars with an opportunity for you know, people to ask questions directly of people who will be able to answer as accurately as possible. We also have a mini course coming up. Um, it starts March 31st, and it is about data ethics. This was offered uh, previously as a shorter mini course, three sessions, and it's been expanded with one more. Uh, the sessions are two hours long. Um, the first 45 minutes of the session is a presentation on that topic, uh, data ethics, the background, data collection, data communication, and social justice. And then it's followed by a break and then an opportunity to talk with someone in the field um, on a topic related to the topic of the day. So it's kind of a two-part, uh, two-hour session. And um, it, attending these four sessions will provide someone with continuing education credit if they are a medical librarian and looking for such. Um, again, free and available uh, to all. Um, information about that is on our blog, which I will link to on, our, on my very last slide. We also have an, um, an internship. It's basically an effort to grow and diversify the profession. Um, this internship is for students from historically excluded racial and ethnic groups, and it's introduce, introducing data librarianship in a health sciences context. Uh, currently, our partners are the Data Curation Network and the NNLM Evaluation Center, and applications are actually open um, through March 31st, and uh, internship uh, more information can be found on the internship page. And I'll talk more about this in an actual upcoming lightning talk. Lastly, I'll just mention that we do have resources online, um, one of which is our data glossary. It is um, under development. You can see the old version of it currently at nnlm.gov slash guides slash data dash glossary. Um, but we are actually revamping it. We're adding a lot of terms, changing out a lot of terms and adding helpful resources as well. So you can see those changes in the next three months or so and see a really useful resource. Um, we obviously couldn't call it a data dictionary because that word already means something, but it's a dictionary of terms and relevant resources. So anyone getting started with data services or needing a, you know, good definition for some of these terminologies can find that at the NNLM data glossary. Um, we obviously are presenting today at RDAP. We're also presenting in May at the Medical Library Association Conference. Our session is on um, the kind of ways that data services can be expanded through collaborating cross institutionally. And it's a panel of half, uh, half of the panel is data curation network members. And the other half are data discovery collaboration members talking about collabor uh, curation efforts as well as collaboration on the data catalog. To reach us, you can see that we have various communication methods. I really wanna point out our blog, which is, um, brand new and we just opened it with our first blog post about the data ethics course. So if you would visit our website uh, and you can contact us at nnlm-ncds at nyulangone.org if you would like more information. So thank you so much for my presentation and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you so much, P uh, Peace. We appreciate hearing about the new uh, National Center for Data Services. And so now let's go ahead and um, move on to our final presenters for this session. And they are Christina uh, Mamone and Christina Stoffer. And they are presenting on behalf of their co-authors, Timothy Middlecoop and Patrick Schmidt. 
Um, so we'll go ahead and turn the screen um, over to the both of them. Great, thank you so much, Ashley. Really appreciate it. And Christina, are you here as well? Yes. Awesome. Uh, well, hi everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to view our presentation. Very happy to be here at RDAP this year. This is my first time attending. Uh, and very excited learning uh, a lot of useful information. Um, and Christina, so I'm Ashley Stoffer. I'm from Penn State University and I'm a research program analyst or a process and business analyst with our associate CIO for research here at Penn State. And I'm Christina Maimone. I lead research data services as part of the research computing team at Northwestern. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. um, so before I, I start talking about this slide, I'm wondering here if, if folks can raise their hand, virtual hands and say if they've ever heard about the RCD field or research computing and data field or research computing and data professionals. Don't know if we have any hands. We've got 23, 22 is fluctuating out of okay. 164. Cool. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So some of you have heard about research computing and data before. So that's great. Um, we're here to talk a little bit more about it today. So Research computing and data, it, um, the field and the people within that field are really a group of individuals that focus on enabling research, um, the specifically computationally and data intensive research. So these folks can exist across a number of different domains, a number of different units, and also scope or scale of the work that they engage in. Um, some examples are data librarians, research data management specialists, computational scientists, uh, research software engineers, uh, research project managers, uh, system administrators, and research IT professionals. So really a broad scope of individuals fit within the research computing and data field. And really what their focus is on is advancing computational and data intensive research. Um, in 2020, there was an NSF funded workshop that had about 100 RCD professionals attend. Um, and really they meant they met to talk about um, the workforce for innovative research and advancing the workforce. And through that um, workshop, they really they identified 12 thematic challenges on what is getting in the way or what barriers exist into advancing um, innovation of science. And some of those included a fractured field identity, lack of diversity and inclusion within the field, um, failure to nurture the workforce ecosystem and pathways into research computing and data professions, compensation, um, enabling viable career paths and others. Um, so really there was these things that we have experienced or seen within the field of like, yes, we need to invest in the people that are RCD professionals, that are working to advance science um, that kind of just sometimes don't follow a linear path into the profession. How can we support these individuals? Um, we need data to be able to benchmark. Oh wait, there is no data. So really what Christina and I did in, in co collaboration with the Campus Research Computing Consortium and the RCD professionalization working group is we conducted us, we developed and conducted a survey um, in 2021 from June to September to try to better understand the people who make up the RCD workforce. So their educational background, their characteristics, and what is called an RCD facing. So what type, uh, and, and Christina will explain a little bit more of that. Um, also their level of satisfaction within the current position and if they feel included or not within the field. Um, so the, our presentation today is doing a little bit of a deep dive into the data. Um, and Christina will walk through those slides. And this little diagram here on the side is an attempt to start to sketch out the research, 
the RCD ecosystem. So you can see RDAP is in there on the left, uh, top left side. And so there's a lot of different groups within this ecosystem that are working towards some of the same goals and there's some overlap. Um, so we're really excited to have some of this data ready to present. Okay, go ahead, Christina. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to take from here? Yes, sure thing. All right, just making sure. So we ran the survey, left it open for several months last summer, ended up with 563 valid responses. And most of those are people who are currently employed in an RCD position. We did also include people who may have left RCD positions, previously had them, hoping to look at what would be behind those decisions to move into other roles, but it's a very small group. And so really we're focusing on those who are currently employed, uh, which is 85% of that. Uh, in terms of what kind of a sample we got, right? So this is not a random sample. We sent out the invitation to the survey to lots of existing email lists which within that RCD ecosystem. And in terms of the responses we got, we got very few from industry, um, relatively few from academic computing centers. So these are some of the big supercomputing centers, um, few from national labs, but we did get a lot from R1 and R2 universities, um, especially from people who are in groups with research computing or variations of that in the name. Some library staff, but not as much as we would hope because we do think of this research computing and data, this RCD field as being very broad and including everyone who is supporting and working with researchers with data and computing. Um, we also only got a few people from most institutions. We had one or two institutions where there were a lot of respondents, but mostly we're getting one or two or three people responding. So what we wanted to do for this conference is look at data professionals specifically within this data. How does that work out? And so, one of the sections of questions we asked was we use this framework that was developed by other folks um, working with CARC of um, thinking of the major areas people in the RCD field spend their time focused on, right? So a lot of us spend time focused on interfacing directly with researchers. We might be working with systems and you know, administering them, setting them up. We might be working with data and that can mean a lot of things from data management to data science, to data engineering, to databases, which we'll get to. Um, software and strategy and policy. Uh, we also include an other in there just in case this doesn't capture the work that somebody was doing. And we were a little surprised to see that only 3% of the respondents put 100% of their time on a single area and two thirds put some time across four or more of these areas. So people have very diverse responsibilities in their jobs, which we sort of knew, but it was still a surprisingly high percentage. Um, of the respondents. And so we're using these answers where we ask, you know, you have 100% of your time, how is it allocated across these different areas or facings um, to identify who are the people in, um, in the set of survey respondents who are really focused on doing data work. So we went through a couple definitions of trying to figure this out. There's only 5% of the respondents who reported spending 50% or more of their time focused on data. So it's 29 people, um, which is a small group um, and did some looking at those, but slightly larger group of 15% of the respondents who put the highest amount of their time on data, right? When they split it up. So that could be they did a 40, 40, 20 split or, you know, 40, 30, 30, um, or they could have had 50% or more. We're going to call these data people <laughs> for the rest of the, the slides. It's 15% of the respondents and looking at how these folks compare to the other respondents in the survey. So looking at how people answered that question of the percentage of time on data facing, um, those red folks there are our data people, which are the majority on data plus some of the others where that was still the, the primary area that they were focusing their time on. Overall across the board, it was averaging 16%. So data people do other things as well, right? We're saying people are spreading their time over other areas, in particular, um, a high amount of time on researcher facing, right? Which makes sense, sort of um, spending time directly engaged with researchers, focusing on facilitation uh, and engaging directly there. And the reverse is also true. So if we look at the folks who spend the majority of their time, how they consider it in a researcher facing role, they're also spending 
you know, a decent amount of time on data, right? So this isn't like there's data people and other people there. It's a spectrum. We're trying to see what, what may be different about those who are focused on data. So we asked some demographic questions um, across respondents to get a sense, again, of the field. We know that there are challenges with developing our field and diversity in our field, and we want some data to go on and base some decisions on and know how we're making progress as we go forward. Um, the data people in the survey tend to have more gender diversity overall as a group than the rest of the respondents. A higher proportion of the female respondents are data folks compared to overall. Um, slightly less racial and ethnic diversity. We used here the US census categories to measure this. I think we may try something different in the future, but we wanted to be able to easily compare to broader labor force and workforce statistics. And so for this first, um, first try, we went with the smaller set of categories that um, are sort of the standard census categories. Um, if we look at ages, the data people tend to be younger. So the median age is a decade up from um, the others in the survey. Uh, the proportion with graduate degrees is very similar, but the fields are a bit different. So there's more folks coming out of a social science or life science background, working, focusing on data compared with um, the others in the RCD field. Work experience tends to be somewhat similar, especially of the number of years of experience in the RCD field. Um, slightly higher percentage though, of people who have only worked in the RCD field who have not had other types of work experience. So overall, we've got a group that's younger, uh, more social and life sciences backgrounds, more gender balanced, but less racial and ethnic diversity as a group. Again, this is we're going with what the respondents we have because it's the best data we have. We know it's not perfect, but trying to get a sense of what the field looks like and who's in it so that we can make informed decisions about how we want to move forward as a field and how we recruit people and bring them in. Um, shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. These are the job titles, <laughs> the, the people listed um, for the data people. The numbers in parentheses are when it was repeated. So very few of these are repeated. Most people have a fairly unique job title. Um, and we get a full range. You get a sense of what types of positions people are in, but still saying, yes, I spend the most of my time on research data in some way. Um, everything from you know, statisticians and data scientists to database administrators to managers and directors to um, software programmers to analysts to bioinformatics people to librarians, right? Very wide range. And this doesn't even include there's alternative job titles because we ask people, we know people often don't use their official job title and use some other job title. And that opens up a whole other set of um, unique titles that we add in here as well of what people actually represent themselves as to their communities. Um, the, we did ask questions about some more specific questions about job responsibilities and uh, compensation. Um, we did it at 10K increments of salary. And the data people overall, um, slightly lower median compensation than other respondents at the individual contributor level. So we asked for job levels like individual contributor, senior individual contributor, lead individual contributor, principal individual contributor, manager, director, senior leadership. Um, and so looking at that individual contributor level where there's slightly more data people than overall, um, and then combining sort of everyone below that manager level, um, looking at that too. And so we are working on paper that will dig more into the factors that go into compensation, how the demographic factors may play in, type of institution, and all of that. But that's, a, that's, that's coming up this spring on our to-do list of work to do. Um, I also asked questions about satisfaction with their position and with working in the RCD field. So we asked folks how likely they are to recommend a position like theirs to others. Um, relatively similar rates, but slightly lower recommending rate for the data people and slightly lower satisfaction overall. But still, we're looking at, you know, 80 percent plus who are satisfied, at least somewhat satisfied with working in the field, um, it's generally a fairly favorable proportion when we look across um, other, other professions or groups or other ways that this might get answered. Um, we also asked specifically about inclusion and this could mean a lot of different things to different people, right? Um, 
based on the type of work you do, do you feel included? Based on your personal characteristics, do you feel included? And again, we see a slightly lower rate of green. They feel included and welcomed among the data people in the respondents, but, um, but it's not dramatic. So, um, but there is maybe something there to investigate in the future. So overall, what does this tell us? Um, similar to what Christina has mentioned throughout the presentation is we can't draw a lot of conclusions right now. This is really the first quantitative categorization of research computing and data professionals that we know of. Um, and the sample was not necessarily representative in that we sent it out to lists of herbs that we're already established and that we are aware of. Um, however, we, we do know that there's a lot of variety in the types of roles and responsibilities that individuals have. Um, and we can, and what else is here? And we can go to the next slide, yes. And so in the future, um, we will continue analysis with a survey um, with the data and sharing the data for, the, for use that others can use it as well. Um, the CART group is also looking at career trajectories within um, the RCD profession. And we're hoping to repeat the survey and broaden participation in the survey as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Christina and Ashley. Um, so now let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in. Excellent. Yeah, that's good to know. I wish I would have you know, thought about like ring lights when I was having to do some recording of stuff all remote at the beginning of the pandemic, but excellent. Um, so let's see, not seeing any new questions. It looks like everything's been answered. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions, go ahead and feel free to throw them in. Um, we'll probably move them over to Whova. Uh, so I'll give it just a moment. Um, but I did want to thank um, our presenters uh, for participating in this session. It's definitely a great set of talks learned a lot. And I also want to thank the audience for your thoughtful questions and also for your participation and for joining us, uh, not only today, but for the whole summit. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again at our next session, which is Lightning Talk session two, and that's going to be at the top of the hour. So 3, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, so for the next 30 minutes, um, we'll be taking a break, and I encourage you all to check out the poster presentations so we have some more interesting stuff that you guys can check out, but also to swing by and check out our sponsors. Um, but also, please note there will be a new Zoom link for the next se uh, session, which you can find in the Whova agenda, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to um, the RD uh, RDAP Summit um, committee organizers. All right. Um, so again, thank you so much. And we'll see you all in a half hour.